Okay, it says that we're live. So this live stream is going to be a little bit different than my regular ones. It's not going to be so much of a Q&A thing. I have a set program that I want to go over with you guys. I'll look at the chat a little bit at the end to answer some of your questions, but we'll try and keep the length of this down so that it can still be a consumable video after the fact. Um, yeah, so for those of you that are watching this after the fact, this was recorded as a live stream and I just kept it posted up to my channel. So if you see me interacting with the chat, that was in the past and not currently. And I'm doing it this way rather than recording a video because that way you can see everything that I do on the fly live. I am, however, putting out a new uh, combination of codec and resolution that I normally use. So I will ask the people in the chat now to let me know because I can only go to 360p, but you should be able to go up to 14 1440p now and so can you guys let me know if you can go at least 1080p or 1440p uh, especially if you're using a like a desktop version of this that would be great and let me know how it looks please okay uh quick just shout out to everybody in the chat for joining thanks so much and uh yeah looks great okay so i'm not ignoring your questions in the chat but we'll save them to the end and if you do have questions please note them and, and make note of them for the end about the Blackmagic Aiden Mini and the Pocket integration because that's what I want to be talking about today. But usually 1440p, perfect. You can go up to 1440 Thanks so much, guys. That's awesome. So I'm just hoping that my connection, because I have it as a max 1440p, uh, but I can see the green square in the bottom corner of OBS there, and it looks good, right? Zero drop frames? Yep. Is that what we're getting? Correct. Cool. Okay. And stream health on YouTube is excellent. Perfect. All right, so let's move on. Okay, so I've got four cameras set up for you right now. Well, three cameras and a screen. Um, so I'm going to pop over here so you can see this. So let's go over the cameras and we'll talk about what we're going to talk about. So this is the main shot. This shot is on, is, is being captured by the Blackmagic Pocket 4K, which I can show you with shot three here. So that's what you're seeing. This is the Sony uh, FX9 is pointed at the Blackmagic Pocket 4K, and that's what's capturing my first angle here on the live stream. The only thing that I'll ask of you, Julie, is please don't block the screen for me there whenever you can, because I use that. I have like a TV set up so I can see what I'm switching to. Um, and then camera two is overhead here, so that if we want to talk about the Ada Mini, we have that set up there so I can point at some things. It's difficult to expose this shot well because I'd have to really underexpose it because these lights are quite bright. As you can see, this is actually supposed to be, maybe you can see here, but it's supposed to be red. But um, <laughs> when I try to expose for a nice exposure, it gets blown out, so we'd almost need to like gel the, the Ada Mini itself. But anyway, we've got that angle. And then over here on number four, we've got my laptop screen. I'm outputting the entire display. And the way that I'm doing that is there's an HDMI cable coming right out of the laptop and plugging right into the Aiden Mini for port four. And I'm doing it that way instead of screen capture because I thought it'd be cool because I'm gonna do some picture in picture stuff that I'm gonna show you guys afterwards, or during rather. So let's start with the updates. So there's an update to the Aiden Mini now, 8.2. And what that allows you to do is control the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras, the 4K and the 6K. So if we switch over to, and but okay, I'm gonna switch over to show you how you can do that, but I'm also going to show you how to do the picture in picture thing. So typically on the Aiden Mini, there's these four picture in picture options, bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left, and you can turn it off and on. If I turn it on now, then you see that I'm, I'm down in the bottom right there, but that is not the default setting. And a lot of people don't know this about the Ada Mini. They just push these buttons and they go, oh, okay. So you can put it in one of the four corners, but it's kind of small. And there's been some talk about that. You can customize that however you want. You just can't use these four buttons. So if you want these four buttons, they're always gonna default to this and the off and on. But if you leave it on, and then instead, let's switch over to this screen. So now I can show you how to do this. Over here on your main switcher option, which is this one, if you go to, I'm just going to quickly check the chat to make sure nobody's saying, hey, I can't hear you anymore. Perfect. Okay, great. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay, so if we go over here, this is the switcher page. There's four pages now, including the camera one for control. And in this, you can do the same thing that you're doing with the Ada Mini. Uh, what's really cool, actually, you know what, let's roll back. So I have the Ada Mini here, and as you can see, I have an Ethernet cord coming out of it. Now, this is not the Pro but the Pro is also gonna have the Ethernet jack. On the Pro, I'm gonna do a whole stream on that. The Ethernet jack is gonna be for streaming. And this one, I'm still using USB-C 
this USB-C cord here in order to send the stream to the computer. The reason why I have the Ethernet connected is because now the Ada Mini is on my network. And that means the laptop here, which isn't actually... I've got my picture in picture while I'm on this one, that's funny. My laptop here, which isn't connected to the Ada Mini in any way, can still control it because any computer on my home network can access the Ada Mini by going into its IP address and then you just have camera control. You have to have the software installed. So in this case, I have the Atom software control installed on my laptop. And then I just type in the Atom Mini's IP address and I can control it remotely. So even though the Atom Mini is connected to my streaming rig over there, I can control it from here, both with the panel, but also with this. Now this would be great because if a second person wanted to control the Atom Mini, they could do it from the laptop and another person could be on that computer and somebody could be holding the switcher. So you can have a lot of different control like that. Anyway, let's switch back to the laptop now, and I'll turn the picture in picture back on. Now, over here, you have the options to, you know, change camera angles just like I was on the Atom. So if I press camera one, camera two, camera three, and camera four, we can go through and control, and you can do your transitions by like sliding this thing up and down, and everything works exactly the same. You just have like an interface here. But over on the side, you can control things. So upstream key, that's the one that's going to control your picture in picture and you want the last one DVE. Normally these keys are used for you know green screen and that kind of stuff but if we want to control our picture in picture the DVE is that one and you can see camera one and you can change different cameras if you want so I could make the picture in picture camera two so now it's the overhead rig showing over here and there was talk where people said oh you can it, like if you read the manual originally it said that the picture in picture can only be camera one and again that's true if you're just using the quick buttons but if you go into the software here it can be any camera you want as I just showed you so I'm gonna go back to the screen turn on that which is camera two but we're gonna switch it back to camera one so you can see my face while I'm talking to you and then the position of X and Y is going to physically control as you can see it moves across the screen and then the scale or size, which is ganged if you hit the, the lock there, so they scale evenly both horizontally, and but you, you could make it scale unevenly if you wanted to. So we'll bump this up to say 0.33, 33% size. And then we can move it where we want. So if I you know, put it over here, let's say, and move it down a little bit, now I'm taking up that top left corner of the screen. And if we look at the Ada Mini again, I can still turn this off and on and it memorizes where I where I was before as long as I don't press any of the quick buttons. If I press one of those quick buttons, it's going to reset to the regular default small size in the corner, but I can still turn it off and on and I can have it now displayed over anything. I could have a picture in picture of myself. So you can do all this with just the Ada Mini, but you do need the software to customize it in the way that you might want to. Okay. Now let's talk about the camera control thing because that's what's the best part here. So for this camera control screen, uh, I'm going to move, so we're going to go back and I'm going to move myself all the way over to the right because I think that, that would create a better view. And I think that about there, does that look good, Jules? Yeah. Okay. So now when you see the camera control, I'm not blocking much. So here's what we've got now. We've got our lift gamma gain controls, the same thing you would find in DaVinci Resolve, which is awesome. And down here you have contrast, hue, you can choose whether you're doing YRGB or RGB. If you're not a colorist, don't worry about it, just leave it on Y. And then your saturation control. And you can refine the individual channels for those as well. If you've ever used DaVinci Resolve or any kind of like color wheel platform, this is basically how Resolve works. And then on the side over here, you can see the cam one is on air. And it's on air because of that little picture in picture thing. If I turn that off, now it says cam one isn't on air anymore. Now if I switch to camera one, you can't see my laptop screen, but camera one is on air again for me. So it tells me I'll always know which camera is being seen by you, even if I have a different display up. So if I switch to four, I know that you guys can't see camera one, even if I couldn't see my stream, because it's not showing me anything, but as soon as I press on, then, oh, what happened to my picture in picture? Didn't turn back on. Hang on, camera one. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I was pressing the wrong button, I'll show you what I did. I was pressing key off and on which is like a it's like a, a complete key which you use for a green screen but for me I have it just keying out to port 4 but what I want to do is turn on that one so if I'm on number 4 here and I press off I know that even if I have my key enabled or disabled you can't see me because on my screen it doesn't say on air and now as soon as it says on air I know that somebody can see me somewhere so you know stop picking your nose or whatever okay now 
you can use just a minimized control over here, which would look like this, and then you could have multiple cameras. You could have camera two, camera three, camera four, filling up this whole screen, and then you can just expand whichever one you want and then control it more thoroughly. And I'm on the screen now. They give you an idea of what these lift gamma, you could like literally grade your footage live. And this is quite useful because often, the way that I've explained to you guys before is that I normally create separate LUTs and either I'm loading the LUTs onto like my ninjas and then streaming from the ninjas or I'm loading LUTs into OBS but then they apply to all the cameras that are connected. What's great about this is that you could actually grade or even make minor tweaks to make your cameras match right from this platform here without needing to do much. But I'll give you an idea of what, it, I'll do an extreme one so you can see it and you can see it on the fly. So let's take our shadows, our lift, and we'll jam them all the way over to the purple and we'll do something pretty extreme. Now you can probably see this changing in that little screen there, but I'll give you the full screen for people that can't. So if this is the look that we wanted to go for, well, we can do it as easy as that. And obviously, you know, <laughs> we wouldn't want to, we'd want to do something better, but as you can see, when you saw my previous stream that I did with the FX9, which I hadn't set up any kind of grade for it yet, the FX9 doesn't have this tool over here. It does have the paint effects in the camera. But anyway, you can see that this shot looks a lot like my regular shots. And that's because I could grade it exactly how I wanted it. And more importantly, I can set the camera to how I want it as well. So now over here, you see how it says, so I have some pros and cons about this, some quirks that I want to talk about, but now you have camera control over here. So there's a few great ones. The most important one is the autofocus. Now, like I have manual lenses and normally I would use like a focus motor to do it, but I don't need to do that right now. I can actually trigger the autofocus on me one time, just like I used to with my Panasonic when I would shoot myself with the GH5. I would use the app to just like focus on me once and then that would lock the manual focus. Well, I can do that now. So I'm gonna take this control down here and first I'm gonna show you that you can refine the focus. So I can actually scrub this area and that's gonna move the focus in small increments. For those that are looking from a small screen, you can see that I'm quite blurry now. And then now, I'm going to press the autofocus button here, which is this sort of like targeted thing. And I'll do a two different examples. So I'll show, I'm gonna press it here and show you what it does. And you might be able to see in the top corner screen a little target that comes up. But first, um, what I'll get you to do, Julie, is can you please put on the status indicate, like see the whole status screen so we can see what happens. Uh, so take away the clean feed. Perfect. So now when I press autofocus, and you know what, go ahead and throw focus peaking on as well so you guys can see how it works. So right now obviously there's no focus peaking because I'm not in focus, but if I press this autofocus button down here in the corner, watch what happens. A little reticle comes up, it focuses on me, and how's the focus now? Do you wanna just confirm it if you need to? It's good. So it just did that automatically. Normally, we'd have to dial it in. And you can take focus peaking off then if you think that it's nice and sharp. Yep. And then we'll, I'll leave the status information up while I tell you a little bit more about the camera. So that auto that autofocus thing is great. Now, it's not continuous autofocus. I can't, you know, move around. It's not going to track me. But it's great for like a one-punch autofocus. And then we're in action here. Now, if we look at some of this information on top of the screen, I have... A, one like bug that I want to tell you about, but still there's some more camera control stuff. So let's switch it back over here again. And if we look in this corner, plus 18 dB, so that's going to be your gain or your ISO. But what I've been finding is that the controls here don't care how you have your camera set. So if you are using gain or ISO on your camera, as soon as you've connected via HDMI now with the ATEM update, you're using gain. It overrides it. And same with shutter speed. I always have my camera set to shutter angle but as soon as you connect it via HDMI, it switches to shutter speed, which is okay because it still remembers your setting. So if I'm on 30p right now for this live stream, it sets it to 160 if I was on the 180 degree, but it's just weird that I can't keep shutter angle and ISO or gain and shutter speed. It just, it has its setting and that's that. And I haven't found anything in the software that allows me to, to change that. Let's just check the comments and make sure that nobody's saying anything weird. Okay, good job. I just checked to make sure you guys are like, I can't hear you, but anyway. Um, now, the as far as white balancing, you can control the Kelvin and your temperature, but you can't control the tint from here. That's something you have to do on the camera. I suppose you could set your own white balance manually by adjusting your red, green, and blue channels, but that'd be more of a grade, not so much of a white balance. Now, there is another quirk to this, which is that when you when you plug the camera like it's it's kind of like as soon as you connect it via HDMI now it 
it's almost like it overrides the control. You can make adjustments on the camera. I'm pretty confident. Can you just hit the rock, the adjust the iris rocker on the front? So just turn the yeah, turn the dials a little bit. Does it go down to f whatever? Yep. All right. So put it back on f4. Um, now you can't see, so you can still control it with the camera, but there's nowhere in here where you can actually see the iris adjustment. But this red thing that you can move up and down, that moves your uh, I, it open it changes your f-stop, changes your aperture, and if you move it left to right, it adds a little bit of like exposure compensation. So to give you an idea, but it's actually hard. It was hard for me to get it to exactly f4 because it's so like finicky. So if I take this and I slide it down a little bit, we're getting are we we're getting darker as we go down, right? Yep. So what am I at now? F5. F5. And if I move it to the right, we're st we're getting brighter, but we didn't really open up that much. 4.6, but I look weird. Let me see what I look like. Yeah, so we've kind of like compensated to the right, and it's not, it's it's fine for a little bit, but I wouldn't use it for a lot of, uh, of adjustment. But we can reset this by, see how it's, you can see right here at 0 0.03. So you're basically just increasing the luminance of whichever one this is. And we can reset that by resetting this. Reset lift gamma gain, reset all. If I reset all, they go back to zero. But this is still not on F4, right? 4.5. So to get it to F4, I have to kind of guess, like slide it up a little bit, maybe there. What am I at now? F4. F4. So I got lucky, but it's not as easy as adjusting the gain here where you can just go click, 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 click. Well, I failed to do that, but there you go. It's not as easy just adjusting it like that. You have to slide something around, which is handy if you want to make smooth exposure changes, except for I'm using a Metabones adapter and everything. So the exposure changes are still kind of like clunk, 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 but you could use it in that regard. And there is an option here where you can just kind of like whoop, slide it down and slide it back up for exposure changes. So that's kind of good for smooth, but I could hear it kind of clunk around because I'm adapting lenses. Okay, so that's the majority of the camera control. You also have a zoom control here if you were using a lens that would allow you to control the zoom. I don't have one on, I'm using the Sigma 18 to 35. All right, so I think that's pretty much it for the camera control. There, oh, there is one other thing, but this is a, I think this is a bug. So you see here, if I click on these ones, I've got detail, off, detail, default, medium, and high. These are the same detail settings that you would find in your, uh, oh, we can go ahead and get rid of the status information now, I think. Thank you. That's something else. You can't control everything you control in the camera. Like I can't make it clean feed or not clean feed. So Julie's still operating the camera for me. But um, with the detail settings, if you go into your Blackmagic cameras, there's an option for the same things, detail off, default, medium, and high. But you can't enable those unless you're in ProRes because RAW obviously wouldn't allow you to sharpen the image. It wouldn't be RAW in that case. But I can't put it in ProRes. If I unplug the, if, if the HDMI is connected to the ATEM, ProRes is not an option. But if I disable the HDMI cable, then I can go back in and change it to ProRes, put on detail sharpening on high, and then as soon as I plug the HDMI cable back in, it immediately switches back to Blackmagic RAW, and I can't enable ProRes again. Now that, it would be the bug, I think, if there's a bug. If they want me to use detail sharpening, I can't also be using RAW, as far as I know. So they might have to work something out there, or there's a setting I missed, but I, I dug through pretty significantly. So Blackmagic, if you're listening, those detail options don't really work. And I've also confirmed that they're not some kind of post-sharpening after raw processing, because that's not the case either. And I can show you guys this. I'll leave it on full screen so you can see. But um, right now we're on high detail. I'm going to put detail off, and I'll get a clear look at me here. And now I will put high detail back on. And you likely didn't notice a difference. But anything else you would do takes place immediately. Like if I were to increase that luma value a little bit, boom. You probably saw it. Immediately up and immediate down. So the detail should also, I'll reset all those again. So the detail should also take effect immediately if it was working, it doesn't do anything because you can't adjust the detail on RAW and you can't use ProRes while live streaming. So that might just be something where they forgot to enable the ProRes option or I don't know, I don't want to speculate, but that needs to be fixed. Also in here, there's another issue you should be aware of. So show color bars is an option, which is great. So if I enable that, which I don't want to because of the bug that I'm about to tell you, but if I enable show color bars, it's going to put your regular, you know, SMTPE color bars, whatever, across the screen, and it generates a tone, which is good too. Um, but I think that might be the problem, is the generation of the tone. So I can see my vocal levels right now, and I'm recording the audio. Normally I go to the zoom. 
I put it today right into the camera. So you can see that my, there's a, yeah, if you want to show us the stuff, Jules, I'll go back to me first until you're ready, but there's a mic right here above the frame and it runs on XLR all the way down and around. And then if you want to get a shot down of the adapter where the XLR cable goes, um, so Julie's going to operate the FX9 and show this. So if we can pull down there to where the XLR adapter is, I like I can even put myself in picture in picture here. Oh, no, didn't do that right. There we go. Um, so that XLR adapter is what comes from this mic and then follow the cord up if you can. And this is the official Blackmagic adapter, a little bit faster. This is the official Blackmagic adapter for the Blackmagic cameras. And then it connects into the bottom of the camera there. And then if you can go back to the, so if you can see that nice and clear. And then if you want to go back to the previous shot, but have the, the screen somewhat in focus, then I can show, or even if you just want to focus on the screen here and you bring up the menu for the audio, we can show the, the weird bug that happens. But I'll want you to show the phantom power thing, okay? If you can just lock it off and jump over to that now. Good. So if you bring up the audio menu, so right there, you can see on the top how it says XLR plus 48 volts mic. And if you go to page two, you can see that phantom power is on. Now, if I show you guys page four here, and just so you know, you were blocking the thing with your finger. <laughs> Look over your shoulder if ever you need to see what you're doing. If I show you guys this, this is going to be obnoxious, so I'm going to turn it on and off right away, and you won't be able to hear me, but just follow what happens, because I want to sort of report this bug to Blackmagic. So I'm going to show the color bars, and it'll take a minute before you can hear me again. So. And now, check, check, check. Don't do anything. Check, 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 check. Check. Is Panda Power still on? Check, check, check. Fender power is not on. We switch back to the other screen. There's no reason why they'd be able to hear me then. And switch back to the screen. Okay. So it's kind of weird. But I hope that you guys can see that. I hope Blackmagic understands. If I enable, if I go to show color bars, it turns off phantom power on the camera. And there's sort of some weirdness there where depending on what, like, camera input, you, oh, depending on what camera input you're on when you do it and then switching camera inputs, but ultimately phantom power turns off and then switching back kills the audio if you were using phantom power. So in that case, if for some reason you wanted to show the color bars and then come back from it, you'd have to then go to the camera and physically turn on phantom power because there's no way to turn on phantom power on the interface here. As far as I can tell, again, I spent quite a while digging through, clicking on everything before I made this video and I wrote down all my notes. And so that's another thing is that the color bars disable your phantom power and detail doesn't seem to work because it only works with ProRes and ProRes doesn't work. And then with that, this is one thing I won't be able to show you because it would kind of kill the stream. But because of the connection aspect of it, whenever a camera is on air, so when it says cam on air up here, as you can see, if I turn that camera off physically by flicking the switch off, it does this weird thing where the back of the camera screen stays on and it gets brighter for like three or four seconds and then eventually turns off. And then when you turn it back on, it stays black for a few seconds. It's kind of like it gets bunged up because maybe the ATEM is trying to control it and it still thinks it's actively controlling it. So when you turn the camera off, it's still sort of displaying the stream somehow. It just, it doesn't clearly turn off and on well. So those are the th three bugs that I would say need to be looked at. And yes, and I also wish that it didn't switch the shutter thing as soon as you connect via HDMI because... If you're not using, if you're using the 180 degree rule, I don't like that it switches that. But there is a pro to that, which I touched on a little bit, which is that if you have your ATEM set to a frame rate, so right now I have it where it's supposed to set everything to 29.97, but you can choose some different options. Let me show you over here. I keep turning on the key instead of my, uh, my thing. So if I go here, see how it says set video standard to 1080p 29.97, but you can choose everything from 23.98 up to 1080p 60, and you can put it on auto mode. And if you put it on auto mode, I believe it will base it on camera one. So whatever frame rate camera one is set to, it will then scale the other ones to that. 
However, it kind of works the opposite with the Blackmagic camera, which is a positive. If you have the A to Mini, in this case set to 29.97, I always have my Pocket 4K set to 23.98, but as soon as I connect it with HDMI, it seems to go, oh, he must be streaming, his streaming is set to 29.97, change the camera to 29.97, it just does it automatically and it's great. And then, ideally, the 180 degree rule would then come in and it would set it to 160. And it does seem to do that most of the time, but I have been able to get it to not do that if my shutter speed was really out of whack. And then I plug it in, it kind of switched to like 140, 1 over 50. But for the most part it's good, but there's a little bit of refinement that needs to be done there. I think that that's about it for like bug evaluation in that regard. Um, Oh, okay, so you guys, I'm glad you guys were following along in the chat here. So for the for people who are watching this after the fact, you can see the like what the chat was seeing, which is that people were saying, uh, camera audio just went super quiet, audio gone, audio levels are low. So that must have been when I was still seeing the levels. There must have been like residual phantom power in the system, and so my audio was there, but it was super low. And that's the problem that I was talking about. And somebody was commented, and Phantom's gone. So that's why I wanted to have that camera angle there so you could see it, you could see it as soon as I enabled, disabled the color bars. So, and that bug is gonna kill some broadcasts, exactly. So it needs to be fixed right away. Um, basically, that, <laughs> this little sub-menu, let me show it for you guys. This little whole sub-menu here needs work. The color bars needs work, and the detail options need work. So, I'm still doing my sharpening in OBS. In OBS, whenever you have an input, uh, you can add a filter for sharpening on that, and I put a little bit of sharpening on because the 1080p output of these cameras on, over HDMI isn't great. It's more of like a monitoring 1080p. It's fantastic they have it now where it works with the ADEM and everything, and I think that's why they've made the, the sharpening an option, but it only works in ProRes, so otherwise you're going to have to do some output sharpening. And Julie, if you don't mind bringing up the filters on OBS there, if you right click on the Ada Mini and then choose filters, we can show you what the sharpening looks like off and on. So right now, what do we have it set to? 0.12? Yes. So there's 0.12 sharpening on, just using the basic OBS sharpening filter. And if you hide it, this is what it looks like with no sharpening. So I'm doing a 1440p stream so that we can get some pretty good resolution and bitrate. By the way, are we still green light with no drop frames? Correct. Perfect. And what's YouTube saying? Healthy. We're healthy, fam. Um, but you can see it's kind of soft, right? And then we'll put the sharpening back on, and it's better. Now, what I don't love about that is that means I have to do, it's a global, we're all good over there, thanks, is that it's a global sharpening, and that means if I do something like showing you this screen, it might be a little bit over sharpened than what we would need. So I don't like having the global sharpening, but I would love having the ability to set independent detail levels for each camera, because the Sonys, for instance, they put out like a really very sharp 4K signal, and they don't need any sharpening, you might see that this one definitely has a different, it almost like on the wood grain looks a bit over sharpened now, right? So I would like the ability to stream in ProRes with the sharpening, with the, de with the detail option, I think that would be quite useful in helping the 1080p feed that comes out of these cameras, because again, it's a bit soft, because uh, they don't output 4K over HDMI, I think that's important for people to know. But this camera control thing is great, the ability that I can just click and focus on myself is fantastic. So that's it for the bugs. Let's go over a little bit more that's in the menu options now. So if I'm going to switch over to this one, and again, I'll pop this on so I, you can see me. So switch your, switch your page, like I said, that's where you control the keys. There's other things in here that you control as well, but you can do your, your camera fades and whatever. The same things you can do with the actual console. Then the media page, this is where you're going to be able to load photos and other like uh, assets that you want to have show up on the stream. There are some restrictions on the file formats. Am I showing? Yeah. There are some restrictions on the file formats and that, that you can use, but there's a more detailed manual with the software update, the 8.2. There's a more detailed manual, and there's also some sample files, so you could always just use them as templates if you wanted and go from there. I don't really monkey around with that a lot, but if you're into that with graphics and stuff, this is where you would do that. And then you get your audio page, which is, oh, I didn't realize I have another level. What's... What's camera two? That's the overhead one? Oh, right, that makes sense. Okay, so before I was normally using the zoom, so this audio page, let me, so this audio page was normally useless to me with the zoom because it didn't matter. But now I'm using it by going straight into the black magic because that uh, gets rid of any audio sync issues, which it does, by the way. I have a zero sync offset and it's pretty darn good. And that's mic right into the, and the preamps are good on the black magic. I'm happy with it. 
I have them turned up quite high though, FYI, I have them at 90. But there is some bonus gain that we could set in here if we wanted. Right now I'm at zero, but we could pump this up another, uh, probably another 8 dB or so on top of that. So you should be covered. And then we have the ability to choose how we want it. So there's camera one, two, three, four, and then mic one and two. On the ATEM Mini itself, let me switch to this one. There's two mic inputs right here, but they're 3.5 millimeter mic inputs. And then obviously the audio can be relayed over the HDMI ports. And all this stuff is gonna be important for the ATEM Mini Pro because most of this is exactly the same. So anything I say here should apply, it's just that will have extra stuff on it. Now with this, you can see your cameras, the ones that are gray are not armed, so the audio is not coming through, and then camera four is my laptop, so there's just no output of audio on that case. And then here you would actually control your different mics, and then you can mix them, and there's pan controls at the bottom as well. So that's all great. I like how I'm getting the levels right here if I need to see it, and I like that when it's armed, it goes colored versus gray. I think that's a nice little interface there. And with the ATEM itself, let me switch over to this view again, you have control, so you see how this one says on for input one? I could have it on AFV, which is audio follows video, and in that case, as I switched inputs, the audio would follow along with the different cameras. But since I just wanna use my main mic here, that's not the best way to do it, but that's how I armed it, I pressed on here. But you can also do it in the you're gonna see it turn off here, and you won't hear me, but it'll turn back on. But over here in the interface, I'm gonna click off down here, and you'll see it. So let me put it back over here, and I'm clicking off now. So you see how the light switched from audio follows video to on? And if I chose off, it does the same thing where it switches over to the audio follows video option. So you have manual control over which mics you want off and on, or you can have it follow using the interface over here as well. So I think that's all pretty cool. Then as I've talked about, I've done other streams on the Ada Mini stuff before, so this is more about the integration update and just a couple little bug fixes. But overall, um, I think it's excellent. I love that I can tweak my color individually for the cameras. And because the Blackmagic cameras are pretty affordable, the fact that now you can trigger the focus on them and tweak the colors, it's so good. It's so much easier. If you've never done like a multi-camera live stream before, it usually takes a while to get things to match and stuff like that. And if you change any aspect of it, then, you know, you got to start over again. If you start switching with a different camera, you're like, oh, I'll throw a Sony in the mix now, everything's all over. So this is great. If you had like four pocket 4Ks, you know, you could dial them all in excellently and, and tweak the color a little bit if you're using different lenses on them, then you could like offset that with the color page, it's great. Uh, so just those things that need to be fixed, detail, setting, because it's raw, color bars, no way to turn the phantom power back on remotely when the color bars turn it off. And I don't like that you can't choose between gain and ISO or shutter angle and shutter speed and it forces you to use a different one than you might be using already. Um, okay, so I'm going to go over to the questions in a minute now to see if you guys had any specific questions. Again, if you can ask questions about the Ada Mini or streaming with uh, Blackmagic, ask the questions now. If you want to at me, that's convenient, and I'll do that. Uh, I'll probably skip over the questions that are unrelated just because of this specific live stream topic. Let me check and see how long we've been streaming now. I'm trying to keep this video reasonable. 33 minutes, so we should wrap it up soon, so I'll answer a few more questions, and I'll you guys to help me if I miss anything. For those of you that don't know anything about the Ada Mini, you can also do transitions. So right now I have it set to cut. That means if I press a button, it hard cuts to it. If I set it to auto, then whatever time frame I have set, which could be half a second, one second, 1 1.5 seconds, or two seconds, so we'll do 1.5, and then I press back to another source again, it'll do a transition for the 1.5 seconds. And it'll be based on whatever type of, whatever type of transition I chose. So mix, dip, you can also have it like wipe across, like whoop, you know, what, whatever you wanna do, you can set them up and have it do it automatically. Mix is just a nice smooth, mix at one second produces a, a decent one, maybe even half a second, produces a, a pretty smooth uh, transition, which I think is nice. But all of these things, as well as the keying options and everything, can be controlled more thoroughly with the software. And the latest software update is a little bit more stable and a little bit less buggy. So that's fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to jump over to the questions now. We'll just give a few minutes to questions, and then we'll wrap this up so I can end the stream so the video package can be delivered 
reasonable for people that are watching this after the fact. And if you are watching this after the fact, feel free to comment regularly, but just realize that your comments, because I know some of you, this trips you up for some of you, your comments, I'm not going to be able to respond to them in real time. I'll be responding to them in a couple days from now. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's check what we got in the chat here. So you can only control the volume in the ATEM and the rest of the audio processing is done in OBS still. So yes and no. So you control the volume, yes. As, oh, you're asking as far as like effects or whatever? Um, so yeah, if I zoom in on here, you can kind of see something. So you can see there's an equalizer right here for each, for all of them, including the 3.5 millimeter mics, and dynamics control. And if we click on dynamics, we have, uh, what do we got here? We've got a gate, we've got a compressor, we've got a limiter, and you've got attack, hold, and release for all three of them. We've got uh, the gain reduction charts here, including the makeup. So you should have pretty, I'm looking across and seeing if I'm missing anything from like, Audition plugins. I would say that this is a reasonable plugin. Can you guys see that? Okay, yeah, you can. So you've got your input, your effects, and your output, and then you can see like if you were doing like a, a you know a reduction, like say you were hitting the compressor or whatever, you'd be able to see where it spikes and stuff like that. So it's it's a pretty good little plugin for dynamics for just like included in the software. And then yeah, you've got your equalizer, which when you click on it, it looks like you've got a five band, six band parametric equalizer. So you can do all that right here, and that will be what's fed to the computer over the USB cable that goes into OBS, so you don't need to use the audio processing in OBS if you don't want to. The only thing that you can't do on the ATEM itself is do that stuff. You have to have the software up, but it's the same, you'd have to have OBS software up anyway, right? So right now, as you can see, I got the laptop here and here, and I can just do them like that, or you could do it beforehand get every tweaked up obviously but you could adjust it on the fly too if you just needed to make a minor adjustment so hopefully that answers the question um what mic do you use it's an octava mk12 they're back ordered indeed uh so i'm hoping that because black magic is now making a push more obviously in the streaming thing that they're going to get some more product out there soon it's obviously a bad time for that because a lot of people have had backlogs when they normally wouldn't so the fact that this is a product that's been back ordered i'm sure it's getting hit twice as hard but they know that there's demand for it, and who doesn't want to make money, right? So it's just kind of like getting them out there. But I'm told, hopefully, they can get that resolved soon. Um, would you be able to bring a guest on via Skype into a two-person stream? You can, but that's still something that's better served for something like OBS, because then you can use an NDI plugin, and then use Skype NDI, and you'll get a much better situation. So I would still do that with OBS. So mic through the camera is the only way to have synced audio. With this one, no. Normally, I would sync it when I record it externally. It's just that you have to set the offset in OBS because then in that case, OBS is getting two sources. It's getting its video source and an audio source separately. And in that case, you'd have to tell it the audio needs to be 100 milliseconds behind or something like that. But if you do run everything through the hardware, then it syncs it for you. But if you want to use you know, your Focusrite audio interface or something, then you're going to have to tell OBS what the audio delay is. And that might just be some testing where you do a clap test, record it, and see how many frames behind you are. Can you have multiple DVE keys? So I don't believe so in terms of simultaneous appearing. It's it's one one picture in picture at a time. I couldn't put like two boxes, but you can customize it. And it, there might be something where you can like duplicate, but you can't have independent ones as far as I know. I haven't been able to do it, but I'll, I'll do a quick peek in here just to see if there's like something new that I missed. So, no, and you can also make the keys a media thing too. Let me show you this screen. Actually, I think I'm probably blocking it, so turn me off. But you can make a camera one, two, three, four, color bars, color one or two, or media player one. So you could also have it be like a... Uh, uh, like a, play a little video or something in the in that instead, but there is nothing for a second DVE at least so that'd be upstream you could do like an upstream downstream thing But it would be more just affecting the box afterwards You could put something kind of like in the box behind you if you had like a green screen You know what I mean, but it would still be in the same box um, You probably took all the Elgato cam links <laughs> I think the banding in this live stream is better than the one shot with the FX9. I think the banding in this live stream... Okay, I'll have to review the things after the fact. It's 
for the live stream is always different than when the video is actually processed, so I have to usually watch them after the fact on YouTube. Have you found a way to change the preset picture-in-picture -picture sizes on the buttons? So I'd recommend watching this video back from the beginning because... Oh, sorry, on the buttons. No, you can't. Uh, the buttons, as far as I know, will always just do their default thing. This thing is like super simplified, so it just does what it does. You have to go in to the DVE option. As soon as you press one of these buttons, it undoes the DVE option where you change the size. Um, so who's this really made for? It's only $299, so anybody that wants to live stream, it's already a great priced capture card. It's a little bit more than just a basic like cam link, obviously, but the fact that you can hit, hook up multiple cameras, if you wanted to even do just two cameras or a laptop screen and a camera, then it's already better value than two capture cards. And if you wanted to do like a picture in picture thing and have everything done on here without needing to know OBS as well, then that's a good option because you can do all the stuff with software for free other than the capture card aspect. If you buy capture cards, you can do all this for software for free, but you know, you're going to be monkeying around with OBS and it's not something you really want to be doing on a live stream when you can just be like boop, 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 like so fast like that, right? So can you pair the Ada Mini with the deck link? I know some people have tried. I haven't tried personally, so I don't want to comment on that, but I know there is a video that you could check out for that. Can the Ada Mini pull a chroma key from purple? I don't know. I mean, I don't want to try right now because I can wrap up the video, but I suppose there's some serious contrast though, so I'd have to really like refine it. But I do believe that you can set your your color and everything that you want. Um, is there anything you need from the pro version for your own use or does the standard version suffice? I would say for me, the way that I work, this one's fine. Again though, for people that are trying to step away a little bit from OBS, the pro version, if I'm going to have an ethernet cable running anyway, then let this do the encoding and broadcasting for you. It does, I could actually just do it all from here. The reason why I don't is because I don't want my laptop cooking up to a thousand degrees and making lots of noise in the shot. But if this was doing the work, then I mean, I could just have the same setup and not even have another computer running OBS. So if that's somebody like you, if you if you don't have a powerful rig and you don't want to monkey around with OBS, then the Pro might be worth it to you. It is a few hundred dollars more though, obviously. And then the recording, again, you would have to run OBS and do a recording and then, you know, edit it and everything afterwards. But the fact that the Pro has a USB recording option where you could just plug into the same SSD that you would use on your Pocket 4K, basically just unplug it from the Pocket 4K, plug it in the Pro version, now you can record that I think that'd be a handy feature. For me personally, I'm comfortable using this system. I'm gonna test out the Pro though and let you guys know if it's like, sense of getting it, I, I would never look back. But I do think that the Ada Mini, just I guess figure out which one of those two people you are. If you don't have powerful gear and you don't want to monkey around with OBS and you want to just control everything here, I think the Pro is worth the money because it's not five times more, right? It's just 300, two, 300 bucks more. But if you like monkeying around with OBS and you have a powerful rig and you've already been streaming with your powerful rig, this is probably going to be a nice compliment to your rig. Super chat here from Cameron Glenn. If I missed the super chat early on, I apologize. Guys, I was blasting through. Thank you so much if anybody did super chat. Appreciate your generosity. Cameron Glenn said, Have you ever done any research for underwater shooting? Any helpful tips? Scuba diving in a pool? While I appreciate the super chat, that is a bit off topic, so uh, typically I wouldn't answer it. However, I can answer this one quickly. I have never done any underwater shooting, save for like a little action cam that goes underwater. So I don't know much information about that. Uh, I, have, I appreciate the super chat, but I'm completely not your guy for that question. Thanks for watching the stream, though. Um, and then... Oh, uh, <laughs> Epos Vox is here. That's a guy, if you guys want to know more about streaming, if you want questions about OBS, if you want to know about like encoder settings and stuff like that, check out Epos Vox's uh, channel. He's got complete courses on all this stuff. Uh, that's your guy. Um, okay, so can I use it directly with Skype? Uh, not this one, but the Pro version, again, is going to have an option where you can like cl click in the Ethernet cord and then... I think I don't know how many platforms there are. There was a list of them. I think Skype was in there, but it was like Facebook, YouTube, whatever. I, I can't say for sure because I don't have it up, but not this one, if anything, the Pro version. For this one, you're going to have to... Oh, well, sorry. Yes, you can use it with Skype as like a webcam. Um, I thought we were talking about Skype NDI again. If you're just talking about can it be your webcam, absolutely. This shows up in your computer the same way that a webcam would. It's just like a video source. So for Skype, if you're just Skype calling somebody, you want to be like, look, Ma, look at me go. Then yeah, you can just choose the Ada Mini as your Skype camera, and then you can go through it. You just can't 
stream a Skype call with this thing is what I meant to say. Again, you want to use OBS and Skype NDI for that. Um, but yes, you can use it as your Skype camera. Um, somebody said can barely hear him. I think that's probably on your end because I think you guys, my audio levels of, yeah, I'm like getting, I'm like minus one dB. I'm fine over here. I think you might need to turn up your, your volume there. Um, is, is the last new ADEM mini model? I'm not sure what that means. Um, okay, so I think that, So it works with Zoom as well as a webcam. Yeah, anything that just you can choose, like you can even use it with like Google Hangouts, anything where it lets you choose your webcam. It basically shows up as like a USB camera in your computer. So as long as you can select what camera you're using, then you can select this as your device and then you have to plug your cameras in here. So yeah. Um, okay, great. So I uh, I, th I think that's going to be it here. Like I said, I want to keep this video as short as possible. I tried to field some questions. 45 minutes. It's a bit long for YouTube video, but uh, feel free to go back afterwards. And for anybody that watched this whole thing after the fact, bless you. I appreciate it. I hope that it was helpful. And Black Magic, hopefully you saw this as well so that you can maybe address those bugs. But other than that, great job with this update. Great job with the integration. Basically, just the ability to control the camera and focus on myself remotely is, is worth it in its own right. And it's it's worth, I think, pairing those things together. I think that that was, that was <laughs> my hands just farted. All right, that's when you know it's time to wrap up the live stream, guys. Anyway, great work, everybody. Thanks for your participation in the stream. Last one here, we just got a super chat here from Sense of Action. Hey, Gerald, thanks for everything you do. Learned a ton from you. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate that. And I think that's a great way to end the stream here. So thanks again, guys. And I uh, hope you have a good rest of your weekend. Take care. Oh, look, fade to black button. <laughs>